Hey guys, and welcome to week two of Anatomy and Physiology Lab. This week we will be covering exercise three, the microscope, and exercises four and five, the cell anatomy, division, and transport mechanisms. In exercise three, we'll be familiarizing ourselves with the compound microscope. The compound microscope should always be handled with care. Remember these key points when using a microscope in lab. Before you begin using the microscope, make sure that the stage is lowered all the way and the scanning objective lens is in position. Always begin the focusing process on the scanning objective lens. Once you switch to low power, high power, or oil immersion, use the fine adjustment knob only. Don't use the oil immersion objective lens unless instructed to do so. Before putting away your microscope, return the scanning objective lens in position, lower the stage, remove the slide, wrap the cord, and replace the dust cover. If an objective lens is dirty or you're having trouble focusing, please alert your TA or instructor. In exercise three, activity one, you'll be identifying the different parts of the microscope and their functions. Please familiarize yourself with figure 3.1 before coming to lab. The compound microscope is able to magnify a specimen through the interplay of two lenses, the ocular lens within the eyepiece and the objective lens. The ocular lens has a magnification power of 10, while the objective lenses have a magnification of 4, 10, 40, and 100. The total magnification of any specimen being viewed is equal to the power of the ocular lens multiplied by the power of the objective lens. For example, if you're using the low power objective lens, the total magnification would be 400, or 10 times 40. Throughout exercise three, you'll be filling out a summary chart on page 28. Flip to your summary chart and fill out rows one and three. In exercise three, activity two, you'll view the letter E slide through the microscope and fill out information about your microscope's field, the area that you see through the microscope, and working distance, the area between the bottom of the objective lens and the surface of the slide. In exercise three, activity three, you'll be determining the field diameter for each objective lens. In order to determine the diameter of the scanning and low power fields, you'll place a grid slide under the microscope and count the number of one millimeter squares that span the field of view. Because we are measuring at the microscopic level, we'll be working in millimeters and micrometers. It's important to note that one millimeter is equivalent to 1000 micrometers. The microscope field decreases with increasing magnification, making it difficult to measure on high power and oil immersion. In order to estimate the field diameter on high power and oil immersion, you'll use the simple formula. Diameter of field B equals diameter of field A times total magnification of field A divided by total magnification of field B where A represents the known or measured field and B represents the unknown field. For example, if the diameter of the low power field, field A, is two millimeters and the total magnification is 50, the diameter of the high power field, field B, with the total magnification of 100 would be one millimeter. In exercise three, activity four, you'll be viewing colored threads under the microscope to better understand depth of field. In exercise three, activity five, you'll be preparing and observing a wet mount of cheek cells. In exercise four, we'll be reviewing cell anatomy and division. In general, all animal cells have three major regions that you'll be able to identify with a compound light microscope, the nucleus, plasma membrane, and cytoplasm. The nucleus is near the center of the cell, surrounded by cytoplasm, which is in turn enclosed by the plasma membrane. The nucleus of the cell is often referred to as the control center of the cell and contains the cell's genetic material, or DNA. The nucleus also contains small, spherical nucleoli that act as the assembly sites for ribosomes. The nucleus is bound by a double-layered porous membrane called the nuclear envelope with large nuclear pores that regulate what passes through. The plasma membrane provides a protective barrier around the cell. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer with proteins, carbohydrate side chains, and cholesterol dispersed throughout. 
Because of its molecular composition, the plasma membrane is selective about what passes through it. It allows nutrients to enter the cell, but keeps out undesirable substances. Valuable cell proteins and other substances are kept within the cell, and waste passed to the exterior. Because of this, the plasma membrane is said to be selectively permeable. The cytoplasm consists of the cell contents between the nucleus and plasma membrane. Suspended in the cytoplasm are many small structures called organelles. The organelles can be thought of as the small organs of the cell, specialized to carry out specific functions. Organelles include ribosomes, smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, peroxisomes, mitochondria, cytoskeletal elements, and centrioles. Table 4.1 summarizes the structure and function of cell organelles. Please complete activities 1, 2, and 3 before coming to lab. We will complete activities 4 and 5 during lab. The cell cycle is the series of changes that a cell goes through from the time it is formed up until it reproduces. The two main periods of the cell cycle are interphase and the mitotic phase, or M phase. During interphase, the cell grows and carries out its usual activities. Interphase is divided into the G1, or growth phase, the S phase, where the cell continues to grow and DNA is replicated, and the G2 phase, where the cell makes its final preparations for division. Interphase is much longer than the mitotic phase. During the mitotic phase of the cell cycle, the cell undergoes cell division. Cell division is essential for growth and repair. During cell division, the cell undergoes mitosis and cytokinesis. Mitosis is the division of a cell into two genetically identical daughter cells. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. The phases of mitosis include prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. To familiarize yourself with the detailed events of interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis, study figure 4.5 on pages 44 and 45. The cells of the body undergo mitosis for growth and repair. Most cells divide until puberty, when the adult body size is achieved and overall body growth ceases. After this time in life, only certain cells carry out routine cell division. For example, the epithelium of the skin will undergo mitosis to repair a scrape or a cut. Unlike mitosis, meiosis is a special type of cell division used to produce gametes, such as sperm and egg cells. Meiosis involves two rounds of cell division and results in four genetically different daughter cells. For exercise four, activity six, please watch the mitosis video posted in week two on Canvas. You'll omit activity six, questions two and three, and activity seven. Throughout exercise five, we'll explore cell transport mechanisms and permeability. Like we discussed earlier, the plasma membrane of the cell is selectively permeable. It allows nutrients to enter the cell, but keeps out undesirable substances. Valuable cell proteins and other substances are kept within the cell, while wastes pass to the exterior. Transport through the plasma membrane occurs in two basic ways, via passive processes and active processes. During passive transport, a concentration gradient or pressure difference drives movement. During active transport, the cell must provide energy in the form of ATP to power the transport process. Two important passive processes of membrane transport are diffusion and filtration. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration of molecules to a region of lower concentration of molecules. If you were to place a highly concentrated drop of dye in a glass of water, you would be able to observe the movement of dye down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration of dye to an area of low concentration of dye. If left undisturbed, the dye would eventually become evenly distributed throughout the glass of water. The rate of diffusion depends on molecular size and temperature. Smaller molecules move faster, and molecules move faster as temperature increases. In Exercise 5, Activity 1, you'll explore the relationship between molecular weight and rate of diffusion by observing the diffusion of dye through auger gel. In Activity 2, we'll observe the diffusion of dye through water with a class demonstration. 
The flow of water across a selectively permeable membrane is called osmosis. During osmosis, water moves down its concentration gradient. The concentration of water is inversely related to the concentration of solutes, or dissolved substances, in a solution. In other words, water will move from an area of lower concentration of solutes to an area of higher concentration of solutes. Tonicity refers to the relative solute concentrations of two environments separated by a semi-permeable membrane. By comparing the tonicity of two solutions, you can determine the direction in which osmosis will occur. Keep in mind that water can cross the plasma membrane of the cell, while many solutes, such as sodium chloride, are not able to cross. To demonstrate how tonicity affects the cell, we will place a red blood cell in three different solutions an isotonic solution, a hypertonic solution, and a hypotonic solution. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of solutes in the solution outside of the cell is equal to the concentration of solutes inside of the cell. If we place a blood cell into an isotonic solution, water will move freely into and out of the blood cell, and the size of the cell will remain unchanged. A 0.9% sodium chloride solution, or physiological saline, is isotonic to red blood cells. In a hypertonic solution, the concentration of solutes in the solution outside of the cell is greater than the concentration of solutes inside of the cell. If we place a red blood cell into a hypertonic solution, water will flow down its concentration gradient and rush out of the cell. Again, you can also think of it as water moving to an area of greater solute concentration. As water rushes out of the cell, the blood cell will shrink or crenate. In a hypotonic solution, the concentration of solutes in the solution outside of the cell is less than the concentration of solutes inside of the cell. If we place a red blood cell into a hypotonic solution, water will flow down its concentration gradient and rush into the cell. As water rushes into the cell, the red blood cell will swell. In some cases, the red blood cell will burst. This phenomenon is called hemolysis. In Activity 5, Experiment 1, you'll place an egg into a hypertonic solution of 30% sucrose and a hypotonic solution of distilled water. You'll track the egg's weight change over time. Based upon the discussion we just had, what do you think will happen to the egg when placed in each solution? In Activity 5, Experiment 2, you'll conduct a microscopic study of red blood cells when suspended in physiological saline, distilled water, and a 5% sodium chloride solution. Again, based on our discussion, what do you think will happen to the blood cells when placed in each of these solutions? You will be emitting Exercise 5, Activities 3, 4, 6, and 7. Although we are omitting some activities, you'll still be responsible for reading and studying the information on active processes on pages 59 and 60. A few reminders as we enter the second week of anatomy and physiology lab. Be sure to take your pre-lab quiz on Canvas the day before your lab. Complete your reviews for exercises 1 and 2 before coming to lab. Bring your masks and face shields to lab and wear closed-toed shoes. Complete the following activities in exercises 3, 4, and 5 before coming to lab this week. Exercise 3, Activity 1, and Exercise 4, Activities 1, 2, 3, and the mitosis video on Canvas.